Hi, um, I'm Yvonne Taylor, and welcome to the first full episode of the Equity Within Unscripted podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about something that I had not planned on discussing for the very first episode of the podcast, but it really connects with um, the kind of work that I do and um, the ideas that I think about all the time and a lot of the people that I'm in community with. Um, and that has to do with equity within higher education. This is almost exactly uh, the year anniversary of when I defended my dissertation. I defended April 6th of 2023, and today is April 5th, um, 2024. And right now, my alma mater is in the midst of a what I consider to be a moral crisis. Um, they laid off 60 staff members who had previously worked in DEI roles um, who thought that their jobs were safe um, after the state of Texas had just put through um, legislation um, to ban DEI offices in public institutions within the state. Uh, they had Their jobs had been restructured um, and they had been moved into other departments and were doing work that um, had been open to everyone. So for example, one um, woman, black woman, um, who was high up in, in the organization at UT had created an organization or co-created an organization that was specifically um, worked with black and Latino undergraduate girls um, and gave them all kinds of opportunities to do things that they um, might not have had the opportunities or the resources to do. Um, that was open to white girls. Um, there was the gender um, and um, queer studies organization, I'm getting that wrong, but um, that had been changed to the Women's Center. So there were lots of things that had been done um, to kind of strip some of the explicit DEI from the work and roles of these folks. Yet, um, after, even after that was done, they were... Um, their jobs have been now eliminated from the university. And it's caused a great deal, like a ripple effect of pain um, across not only the University of Texas, um, but the and the students, staff, and faculty who remain, um, and the people who lost their jobs and their families and loved ones, but all of us who were touched by their these folks whose great um, righteous work had been done on those campuses. And we, UT is a huge place, um, has many, many um, hundreds of thousands of alumni. So the ripple effects of pain are all across the nation and possibly even the world right now. Um, speaking to that, just to kind of lay a little groundwork on what's, so that you understand what's happened. Um, one of the alums, Ryan Miller, Dr. Ryan Miller, who is a uh, professor in North Carolina, um, wrote an article in Inside Higher Education that just came out today that's titled, um, DEI isn't scary, political purges are. I mean, it really describes that this as a political purge um, of people who were doing wonderful work that um, without whom he might not be a faculty member today. He's a queer white man. Um, he wrote this heartfelt article that's in Inside Higher Education. And there are so many other articles like this that um, have been written and will be written. Um, but what I wanted to talk about today um, in relation to that is that within my dissertation, in the, um, the findings and implications and discussion portion of the dissertation, I had a paragraph about this kind of thing that um, my dissertation co-chair questioned me about. And so I want to read part of that, and then we'll kind of get into um, how I responded, and then also how my son, Xander, um, who was 17 years old at the time, responded. And that's going to kind of lead into a conversation between the two of us. Yeah. <laughs> so what I wrote that that Dr. Rich Reddick um, questioned me about during my dissertation defense was that the participants in my study frequently mentioned the impact that donors and legislators have on the campus culture. Um, so I'm gonna read here what I'd said. 
The impact of donor relations and legislative influence were mentioned relatively frequently in interviews with staff, including those who were not in philanthropic job positions. Both donors and legislative influence were coded as white and male. When participants referred to what the donors would agree or disagree with, the donors they meant were white men with wealth and power, like the donors who wrote directly to the president to influence the decision on retaining the Buck the Rebel mascot. Donors are valuable resources in higher education landscape um, that is experiencing dwindling state dollars and stiff competition. In addition, as a flagship university, Haven State Universities, that's a pseudonym, governance included those appointed by the state legislature, who at the time were mostly right-leaning white men. These factors may have had a strong influence on unequal resource distribution, a tenet of racialized organizations, and are worthy of further research. I used Ray's theory of racialized organizations um, and combined it with Acker's theory of gender organizations as a framework in my dissertation. So now I want to share that a particular moment in my dissertation defense where Rich asked me um, more questions about that because it seemed like a big thing. And I want to take you back too to the idea that I wrote this and defended this dissertation a year ago, and we weren't experiencing the anti-DEI legislation yet at that time. We were not, um, we weren't experiencing it in, in Claudine Gay, you know, hadn't even become, um, or if she had, she had just become um, president of Harvard. So these things had not occurred yet um, when I wrote about them, and they've only become much bigger issues since. So now I'm going to share my screen and kind of pull up, if I can find it, the video. Um, I'm gonna have to edit this thing. So I'm gonna share my screen just yet. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen and play this portion of this video. I, I agree. I wanted I wanted to really hear more about sort of uh, the structural um, recommendations you would have. So, in other words, you talk in the final chapter about, hey, the legislature has a great influence on the institutional uh, context. Hmm. Um, and I was thinking, as a dissertation writer, you get to sort of put in the world, what are the things that need to happen? You don't have to be worried necessarily about how those things happen, right? Because we get bogged down that thinking, well, how will this happen? But how will we convey, for instance, to legislators or, or boards of trustees or uh, people in systems that are actually sort of baking in a lot of the inequity you're talking about? Um, I want to maybe to, to push you and think about, well, what would you say? Like, how likely is it that your great work will be understood and interpreted by folks in those spaces? Uh, and how might that happen, right? Uh, and I think this is the idea of temporal radicalism, right? So, you know, it may not happen in the context of the way that we're talking about, but I wanted you to maybe think about it a little bit and see if there are, there are ways of getting that out. I mean, one thing that's become obvious in our contextual uh, environment is that there's a lot of people operating under assumptions about how higher education works. Yeah. Uh, and they may not be open to learning that. Let me make that very clear. But maybe some are. I'm just curious if you have ideas about how to engage that population, how to directly engage with that uh, group that perhaps is kind of in the background of all of this. You know, which I don't think we have a lot of good faith actors um, in, in right now um, within our legislature to to try to engage those folks. So I, I, if I were going to assume that there are, I would say that one of the decisions that I made to make this dissertation inclusive um, and inclusive of white women as well um, is because I wanted 
people have to understand that these um these what what's these structures negatively impact not just people of color but also negatively impact white people too. Um, that witnessing other people experiencing harm or or um, which has a negative impact on folks, which I cover in the dissertation. Um, it has a negative impact on lots of people, but also um, that I, which you know, I, it's a, for me, it's a hard question because I don't, I don't see those folks as being willing to listen to reason and logic. Um, so, what do you have? A, yes, you can add something. Yeah, why? Because sooner or later it's going to be Yes. And so there's a fun for everybody. Yes. Meaning that they, that we all have something that we share and a goal that we share, white, racist or not, that we'll have to work together to achieve success. You know, how it happened in the past is how it happened. Yes. Did y'all hear that? That's brilliant. That's my part. He's, he's cited in the dissertation because I he's been my partner in this work. Let's see you on the video because that deserves some um, respect can, by his name. Can you, can, you, can you repeat a little bit? I can only hear some of what he was saying. Can... I was basically saying that sooner or later the people in power or the people who have the, the control to make these decisions or to put them in action, they're going to have to cooperate because it hurts them not to. The, their goals, which however selfish they may be, they need us to make those goals achievable. And we're going to have to help them with that in order to get what we want, which sucks, but also that means they're gonna have to help us. We all have a common goal, which is to succeed. So wow. I, we've been talking a lot about Heather McGee's book, The Sum of, um, is it, it's not The Sum of Us, is it? Um, I think oh, it's it The Zero Sum Game and The Sum of Us, it's about The Zero Sum Game. We are all in this together, helping people, and, and I think that's what you just said, Xander, is what I was trying to get at and what I was saying about why I included the populations that I included, is that we are all in this together, and, and these systems, may have had stronger effects on um, the women of color, and in particular Black women in the study, but they had negative effects on all of the women within the study. Um, and so that is, this is all going to affect all of us. These systems are not sustainable working in the ways that they are. Um, and so there's, there's some ways that we have to kind of figure out how to talk to um, people who don't see that yet and don't understand their place within within the system um, and how it's coming for them too. So Zan, that leads us to today. Like a lot of the things that I was talking about in the dissertation defense a year ago um, have been like exacerbated now. And um, I, 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 I've thought a lot about your words about um, we all want the same things. And if we all want the same things, ultimately we need to be striving for a win-win. But if you've got people who are have a great deal of power um, and don't want a win-win, how do you create any kind of leverage or how, you know, the, basically the very question that Rich was asking me, how do you appeal to these people? I still don't have an answer to how you do that because they want us gone. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, you ask them what they want. What do they want? If they, they, they want us gone, I mean, they can't have us gone because they still need us. How they going to build without us? Right. But they don't, definitely don't want us in positions of power. I mean, so, and, and, and underlying what I'm saying is an assumption that I am making, and I believe it is an accurate one, that anti-DEI, anti-CRT, anti 
is ultimately anti-Black. Um, it is anti anything that is not white male um, moneyed um, and um, heterosexual, um, cisgender, you know, anything outside of that. Um, but very much um, DEI is almost coded as, as Black now. Um, and so I'm just letting the listener know that that is the um, assumption that I'm operating under as I, and I think, I think it bears out in who they're targeting um, and um, the, the majority of the folks that get hurt, although, you know, is ultimately there's, it's anti-blackness. Um, and so, no, they can't have us gone, but they definitely they want, want us under their, of their positions. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want us to be equal. Right. So we are in Hollywood, but um, they still gonna have to ask us for help. That, I, that to me seems. I, I'm just gonna say it seems um, idealistic. No, it's not idealistic. I think it's like. Tell me why. I think it'd be illogical to assume that they will wipe us out. I'm not saying they'll wipe us out. Or they'll keep us out. But in their position, because. Even if they like their their system is built, it's designed to fail. Um, it's designed to topple all over their heads. And so in that way, if you play the long game, we'll still come out victorious. But you know, that's people will have to suffer years and years and years for that to come. So how do we do something different than that? Um, where oh, you know, people will have to suffer for years and years and years. What what should we you know, one of the things you were saying is that we have power that we maybe we don't recognize some of the power that we have. Um, and yes, we are all needed. But one of the things that we you said in another conversation was that they are audacious in what they're doing and that we are not as audacious in the response. We have to find out what their weaknesses are. And they intentionally made their weaknesses not obvious, but they're becoming more and more obvious because the intentions are right. Um, I mean, they're saying it out loud. They're saying they don't want black people in these positions. Mm -hmm. They're not hiding it. They're not hiding it anymore. They, they aren't pretending to be allies of black people. Right. Like, you know, Trump saying, look at my fellow African American in the crowd. Right. They're not doing that shit. They don't sorry, they don't care about that anymore. Mm -hmm. They just want to keep us out and keep us down. Right. And keep us lower. So what I think I'm hearing from you is that because they are making it obvious, um, we don't have to pretend like it's not real. <laughs> you know, we what don't have to, we don't have to live in an artificial barrier. Mm -hmm. we, we can say we can break all loose. Mm -hmm. And we don't we can there, that scares them. Yes. That's what scares them. Yes. It's when we don't pretend, it's when we aren't under the same you know, rules that they live in. Right. When we say, no, nah, I'm just going to do my own thing. Yeah. That's what they hate. That's what terrifies them. Right. That's what makes them, that's what, but it's also what provokes them to kill us. Right. So we're going to have to get killed in order to kill or, them. Oh, no. All right. I don't want to talk about killing. Um, in my podcast, I mean, I'm serious. Yeah. In order to kill the system that they live in, right? We have to let ourselves be hurt a bit. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think though, because I want to take it in a, a different direction, that like you mentioned AOC and how she's not only surviving but thriving and being authentically herself. Um, and that they don't like that. <laughs> well, um, what they don't like is that is the fact that they worked so hard to build a system where, that where that's impossible, and she's doing it effortlessly. Right, right. That's what they don't. Right, like. that's what they don't like, and that reminds me um, also of uh, the mayor of Baltimore. Um, he is the, the very same. Yeah. Well, we talk a lot about just thriving. That's what they hate. Yeah. We are just thriving and living like normal people. They don't like that. Right. They want us to know that we're black and that black is less than. Mm -hmm. That's what they want us to know. But we're like, no, we don't believe that. And that's not true. Right. And we're going to live like that's not true. Right. We're going to live like we're better than you. Actually, that's what that's what she's doing. 
She's living like she's better than them. She's not saying she's better than them. She doesn't have to say it. They already feel that way themselves. That's why they hate her so much. Mm -hmm. It's because they feel insecure when they're living here. Right. Because she's living authentically and they're not. And that's what makes it better. It's not like the inherent humanity of a person. No, it's authenticity. It's authenticity. It's not good or bad. Right. It's real and fake. Right. <laughs> right, right. So what I'm hearing from you is that the, that freedom, that freedom, cultivating a sense of freedom and an actual you know, freedom for yourself to embody it. Embody it. Yes, yes. To embody live. it and to live it. That's what um, they can't stand. It, yes. And not only can they not stand it, that will they provoke can't them to put it. themselves out of their positions of that. Yeah, yeah. And here's the thing it, that is a that is our power that they cannot take away. They can try to snuff it away. Um, they can try to to hinder it. They can try to do all those things. That's what it is. But to refuse to sit in the back of the bus. Yes, that's what that is. That's what that is. To, to to sit in at a restaurant that says you're not meant to be there. That's what that is. We say, well, but we are meant to be there because we're human. Right. Right. And, and if, if the Constitution is constitutional, we can be here. Yes. If it's not, we can't, and that's what you're saying, but we don't live, we don't agree with that. We think America is free. Right. And so we're gonna sit here and be free. Yes. We're gonna yes. actually stand for what America says it stands for. Yes. That's what we're doing. That's what we do. That's we, what we do. We stop pretending that this is what America is and we embody it. I think I think that's awesome. <laughs> I think that is awesome. We're supposed um, to be the land of the free and the home yes. of the slave. That we're not. Yeah. So let's be that. Yeah. And so I think what has been very frustrating um, for those of us who are in organizations and systems like academia is that we have done these this peace meal thing all along to appease, you know, folks to make it look a certain way. And then to... wait, the, and then they just immediately, when they have gained the, the 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 ability to say the thing out loud that they have had not been able to for you know fifty years since the civil rights movement, um, then those systems and that we've worked so hard for just just caved, you know, they're just caving like a house of cards left and right. Um, however. What, what is needed, not only from the systems, and some of these systems may never give us that, but for us with these marginalized identities is to continue or to even more live out loud as our authentic selves. Um, and and to, to, to and not to, um, to put a lid on it anymore, but to live, that is the, the, that is the biggest power that we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all we have to do is just be ourselves to do that. Yeah. Without hiding ourselves. Without hiding ourselves. Because they were able to push us into sh our shells. Yes. And, and then through things is... like respectability politics, making ourselves palatable if we were queer people, you know, um, all of these different ways that we've done the fact to, that you to can't say certain things out loud in a room without people going quiet. Yes. We're gonna say screw that. Yeah. We're gonna say those things and pretend or not we're not gonna pretend like those things aren't normal. Right. Right. Like those things are out there. Yeah. I'm just going to say them because everyone's talking about them on the internet. Why should we talk about them in front of other people yeah. in person? In school. Why? Right. It's because of the, the people who are in charge of these systems are the same people who don't want us talking about right. these things. Right. That's why the social media scares. Them. Yeah. That's why they're trying to be on TikTok. TikTok. Yep. Okay. Well, I think we have talked, I don't know how long this has been. Um, this being my first episode of um, equity within unscripted but we've kind of gone through the map and um and really shared some thoughts and i would love to hear what um you the listener have to say about the ideas that we've shared and um and also about the inequities that you're seeing um uh and and what we can actually do what our power actually is um thanks for talking with me today man